Good afternoon. We are here for the main session on uh, dynamic coalitions. I am Marcus Kummer. I'm the co-facilitator for the Dynamic Coalition Coordination Group together with my colleague Jutta Kroll, who will be the co-moderator of this session. Uh, let me start by saying a few words about the dynamic coalitions. They are as old as the IGF. They started at the very first uh, IGF meeting in Athens back in 2006. And the reason then was, you may well ask, it sounds a funny name, dynamic coalition. Why are they called that way? The reason is very simple. There were those who wanted the IGF to be a year-round exercise and others who didn't like that. And then someone had the brilliant idea, well, maybe some dynamic coalitions might emerge of people who work on the same issue, who coalesce around the same issue and want to work together between the annual sessions. So instead of ha having working groups, that sounded like more a formal structure, they called themselves dynamic coalitions. And they have been with us since Athens. By now we have 28 of them. In the past few years, we tried to organize a session where each dynamic coalition tried to showcase a bit the work they have been doing over the year. Whereas this year we take a slightly different approach and my colleague Jutta will explain the concept of this session. But the aim is we want to show that the dynamic coalition collectively can contribute to the main themes of the IGF. And with that, I hand over to Jutta, who will introduce the concept of the session. Please, Jutta. Thank you, Marcus, for giving me the floor. Yes, Marcus has already mentioned that we now have 28 dynamic coalitions. And what they all have in common is threefold. First, they are all addressing, in one or another way, human rights issues, trying to ensure that people can enjoy and exercise their rights appropriately also in the digital environment. And to be clear in this regard, we are not talking about a specific set of human or digital rights, but of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Rights. Second, all dynamic coalitions are working towards achieving the SDGs and to accelerate the process, which is the topic of this session. In a stock-taking exercise, Dynamic Coalitions have elaborated each for their work, how it's related to the SDGs, to what SDGs it's related, and this was, will also be showcased within the next 90 minutes. And third and most important, Dynamic Coalitions have a huge outreach into their respective communities. Dynamic coalitions build a network of people and organizations that address and engage a much broader community beyond the internet governance ecosystem. Uh, please let me quote what Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, Mr. Juan Huali, I hope I pronounced that right, has said in setting the agenda for the IGF 2023 on day zero. He encouraged all of us to accelerate digital applications for the SDGs, to enhance infrastructure and digital capabilities to bridge digital gaps and divides, and to strengthen digital cooperation across all countries. And bearing that in mind, we suggest to make this session a starting point to unleash the potential of the Dynamic Coalitions Network and their communities to achieve the SDGs. And with that, I'm handing over to Marcus to ask the first question to one of our panelists. Thank you, and we are in a very big hall. I would very much encourage you to come forward a bit. That would look a little bit more engaging when we sit together, not so far away. But with that, we introduce the panelists when you give them their questions. We have five panelists here in the room and one on, uh, online. The first one is Lisa Petridis from Open Educational Resources. So I would like to ask you three questions. How do we safeguard human rights in the digital age and how do we accelerate the SGDs, SDGs? Second question, do we need an awareness campaign and if so, where should it start? 
And lastly, what role for the open educational resources in all this? Please, Lisa. Great, thank you very much, Marcus. And uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to be here today. I want to just say briefly that the OER, or the Open Educational Resources Dynamic Coalition, is uh, a newbie to the Dynamic Coalition family. Uh, only in, uh, I think, January of this year have we joined. Now, the, the OER Dynamic Coalition has been around for uh, over almost four years now. Uh, we were started by UNESCO, who uh, passed a recommendation on the use of open educational resources, and I'll tell you a little bit about what that is, uh, back in November of 2019. And the Dynamic Coalition was created to really propel forward this work around the implementation of the Dynamic Coalition uh, within the OER recommendation. And so, um, and, and basically, an OER, a UNESCO recommendation is a normative legal document signed by 193 countries. And it mean, what it means is that uh, this has to be built into the language of member state governments when they're talking about uh, something as important as education, which is very exciting. Our Dynamic Coalition has over 500 members, and it's very active. In its kickoff was the year before uh, the month. I'm sorry, the week before the pandemic started. So most of the original work has been through the uh, has been through Zoom, and it's only in this last uh, year, of course, that we've been out and about. So the Dynamic Coalition um, has really. Uh, uh, five components. It's about capacity building for all key stakeholders. It's about developing supportive policy. It's about inclusive and equitable access to quality, multilingual, open formats uh, of educational resources, including persons with disabilities. It's about nurturing sustainable models for OER at the national, in the regional, and institutional level. And overall, this dynamic coalition really has as its charge to facilitate international cooperation around the member states. So to answer your question very specifically, you know, I'm gonna sort of, since I'm first here, I'm gonna start with the premise that education is a human right. So when you ask about, um, you know, how do we ensure awareness about human rights? Well, that means access to knowledge. And that means knowledge that is contextualized, shared, transparent, that it's openly licensed, openly accessible, because the free flow of information knowledge is really key. So many of you are here because you're working on such important issues around access to the internet and devices, but it's what flows through these devices that is really critically important. So OER, as I said, is about education content that's freely available and openly licensed, and its purpose is to be adopted and adapted to local context, and that includes the localization of language, of culture, and it must be portable and interoperable with other platforms and libraries. It also has to be well described, pedagogically sound, and transformational. So what this means when we talk about the acceleration of the SDGs, well, for example, we have the SDG Academy, which has created some terrific content uh, around um, the SDGs. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. And uh, it's around climate action, environmental issues, min many things. But the point is, with openly licensed content, this is how we build the capacity, this is the capacity building component that we really need to achieve to be able to educate people, not just about what the SDGs are, but what are the actions, what's the education, what is it that we need to know in order to really address and make a forward movement around the SDGs. Um, I want to just emphasize how important that this, the whole and open piece is of this. Uh, we have so many examples from the past. Some of you may have heard of the, the World Bank's knowledge management system of resources many years ago that was not opened. It's gone. Those resources you can't find now, right? So when we're talking about openly licensed content and OER, something that is portable, that it lives on, that it's dynamic, that it's not locked down in one system so that when that system uh, is gone, that the content goes with it. So the OER is really about being necessarily distributed. 
And I think this is really key when we're talking uh, about the SDGs and the acceleration of them. So we really need open. I, I haven't heard that word enough this week. Uh, we're talking about open education. We're talking about open data, open science, open access, uh, non-proprietary, non-controlled environments that are freely available and accessible. So we really need um, thriving, living content where learners see themselves in the content, inclusive of all voices, traditionally marginalized voices, and it's accessible. This is, this is the role that OER play in regard to human rights and the acceleration of SDGs. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa, for explaining also what the open and open educational resources means and how relevant it is. Uh, my question now goes to Mohammad Shabir, who is representing the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. And Mohammed, I think this is one of those who have been early established in the IGF. Uh, uh, one Dynamic Coalition, and as far as I know, you have been working even when we had only the eight millen millen Millennium Development Goals that were adopted in 2000, uh, before later than we had the SDGs. Um, could you tell us how does having access to the internet helps to compensate disabilities? And how can we achieve a broad and a wide-ranging understanding of accessibilities? Uh, yes, thank you very much for the opportunity and the question. As you mentioned that the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability, of which I co-coordinate, uh, is one of the earliest dynamic coalitions in the IGF system. Uh, the purpose of the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability is to first make the Internet Governance Forum and its uh, online and physical spaces accessible, give some recommendations. We also had a paper on the uh, accessibility of offline and online events as well. Uh, this year, we tried to sort of rejuvenate with a renewed vision of accessibility towards person with disability and the digital spaces. So the second purpose of Dynamic Coalition in general is to make the digital spaces accessible for people with disabilities. With that purpose in mind, the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability on the principle of nothing about us without us started a project uh, on bringing actually persons with disabilities to these forums. Uh, we have more often than not noted in earlier IGFS as well that we need to bring more people with disabilities, but that, as we all know, requires more resources in terms of finances and in terms of efforts as well. So DCAD this year had three fellows from different regions, one from Africa, one from Asia Pacific, and one from Europe, actually provided resources to them to, with the fellowships, uh, with the generous funds of, of the support of Google and WindSurf, to actually enable them, uh, along with their accessibility requirements and accommodations, to come to Kyoto, participate in IGF activities, and then uh, enjoy and contribute into the discussions that are actually going on. We not just facilitated these people, but also facilitated uh, local people with disabilities. And on the session that we had on 9th October in, uh, in the IGF, uh, we had two persons with disabilities uh, from Japan itself to uh, participate and contribute in our discussions. Uh, with that premise, I would uh, come down to the questions that we are talking about here connecting the disconnected. And when we talk about the disconnected, uh, more often than not, it's the discussion about 2.7 billion or whatever the number uh, we have in our files of the disconnected from the internet. 
but dynamic collation on accessibility and disability has a different purpose. It represents 1.3 billion persons with disabilities. That is transgender, trans cultural boundaries and trans geographic boundaries. You may have, as I often have been saying, access to state of the art technology. You have, you may have the device, the state of the art device in your hands with hi-fi internet connectivity available to that device. But because of, as it was mentioned, what flows into this device was not made accessible for a certain kind of users, those who access those devices with a different manner in some sort of, uh, with the help of screen readers or with the help of uh, some audiovisual devices or with the help of some uh, one-handed devices. So because those devices, those softwares, those platforms were not made in that sense that these technologies uh, could interact with, uh, with, the, with that kind of content, the person may remain unable to access those kind of contents. Uh, the best example of that would be some of the information that was placed on the IGF uh, website itself of 2023. So, uh, in that sense, when Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability uh, aims uh, to bring persons with disabilities into this discussion, it aims to reach those discussions through the participation of actual persons with disabilities uh, to the forum and uh, to contribute to the discussions. Uh, with regards to accelerating the SDGs and connecting them with the MDGs that we had uh, since 2000, uh, unfortunately, MDGs did not have any specific uh, key indicators to address issues related to persons with disabilities. But fortunately, we do have those indicators in the SDGs, and there are a number of SDGs, and every SDG has specific indicators that address to the needs and requirements of persons with disabilities, such as education, employment, and smart cities, uh, access to different resources, et cetera, et cetera. So we do have these indicators out there. We do have SDGs that uh, lay at the top. And then uh, we have persons with disabilities interacting with these uh, initiatives. Uh, but when it comes to the implementation of those indicators, uh, we, we sort of uh, fell uh, a little bit behind uh, in that context. Uh, uh, a survey which was done about of 1 million websites back in 2022 indicates that about 97% of the home pages of the websites uh, were or had some accessibility related problems. So with this kind of stats, uh, staring us in the faces, we have to say that there is a long way uh, to, to cover uh, if we want to actually bridge the divide between the digital haves and have-nots. And when I say haves and have-nots, I do not just mean the divide between global north and global south, but this divide could, could very well be existing within the global uh, north itself, where we have state-of-the-art technologies, but due uh, to the accessibility barriers that may come in the way of, of uh, users interacting uh, with the digital accessibilities and these environments uh, may interact with the barriers and may face those barriers. Due to those barriers, they may remain unable to participate in online spaces and uh, due to that, they, remain, they may remain unable to participate in the acceleration of SDGs and other processes. Thank you, Mohammed, for that and for your important work you are doing. May I also recall that at the micro level in the IGF, it's thanks to the DCAD that we have made big progress on accessibility for participants at IGF meetings. 
once again thank you for your excellent work and your hard work in this important issue. May we turn now to a remote participant, our old friend Alejandro Pisanti, who is currently in Washington, D.C. He represents the Diamond Coalition for Core Internet Values. Can we make him uh, access and show him on the screen and give him uh, sound access that we can hear him? Uh, Alejandro, Hi, can Marcos. you hear us? I hear you very well and uh, Excellent. I hope you can hear me. Good to see you indeed. We can hear you and see you. So we have heard already on the importance of openness, and openness is also a very important core value of the internet. And now uh, this IGF, there's been a lot of hype about artificial intelligence. And I would like to ask the questions, do you see a danger for the core values of the internet through, uh, op through uh, artificial intelligence? or the other way around, how can AI be deployed to the benefit of the core internet values? You have the floor, Alejandro. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, thanks, everybody. Apologies for some glitches in the connection. Computers have no word of honor, and uh, it, it pulled a big restart on me, but I'm here. Uh, pleased to see you all, and uh, to your question, Marcus. Uh, I think it's a mutual challenge between what artificial intelligence uh, can do and what internet governance can tell us about artificial intelligence. Uh, we have see, we are seeing a flare up of interest in artificial intelligence due to one small niche uh, within the broad field of artificial intelligence, which has become very public and very transformative, which is generative artificial intelligence specifically for large language models. Uh, which uh, is a way to access a huge database of words. Uh, uh, instead of making an app a, a very abstruse query, you make your query that looks like a sentence and the system replies with something that looks like a sentence or many sentences or what looks like a whole book. But artificial intelligence is a much broader field. Uh, even neural networks, uh, deep learning uh, and so forth, which are yet the object of public attention in the last decade are still a subfield within this. And we, need, we see what we know of artificial intelligence, uh, many tools for uh, quantitatively managing things on the internet. Actually, artificial intelligence is actively used uh, in uh, many algorithms that make the internet better, as well as for some of them that make uh, trouble on the internet, uh, more on the application layer. Uh, people who run cybersecurity operations, people who just run networks, people who plan network capacity, they are all using artificial intelligence for many years. So here we can see definitely that artificial intelligence poses a positive uh, contribution to the growth of the internet and to the protection of its values like interoperability, openness, accessibility, and very importantly, scalability, and our more superposed need for security. There's also a challenge because this is like an, an arms race between what we would call the good guys and the bad guys. The people who are attacking the internet are also using artificial intelligence, for example, to discern patterns of operation, to extract passwords from, uh, or even beyond password kind of uh, security protections. And the good guys, the people who are concerned in keeping the internet open and functional and reasonably secure for everybody, uh, are using artificial intelligence to detect these guys, to thwart their actions, to detect how they behave, and so on. Uh, what internet governance specifically can bring to this field is we should absorb the experience, we should extract the lessons learned from almost three decades of formal studies on uh, internet governance and formal construction of institutions and see, for example, what the multi-stakeholder uh, procedure for governing or for uh, managing artificial intelligence uh, could bring us. We could see that the challenges, for example, of scalability, of crossing national borders, of reducing friction, uh, of managing and manipulating memory, which we have learned to deal with in some ways, at least to dissect and attack differentially in internet governance are now things that are affecting us on the field of uh, generative artificial intelligence language models. And we could also see that we never 
uh, established a single uh, global government of the internet or a single global uh, institution for the governance of the internet. We have a specific mechanism for the unified identifiers like uh, uh, the DNS in ICANN. We have the standards uh, in the IETF. We have very focalized groups like the anti-phishing working group or the messaging anti-abuse working group, uh, which focus on specific problems, bring the relevant stakeholders together, and uh, also find the funding to do these things and the way to have teeth so that they can act upon the malicious actors to some extent. Uh, they are also adaptable to the diversity of different cultures, different, uh, 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 let's say, national traditions, policies, legal structures, and aware of the fact that if you try to squeeze the system too tightly, all the bad actors will act outside the system. There's much arbitrage there. So probably that's what we can see in this big picture. There's an interaction between those, these things. Artificial intelligence can be used both to damage and to defend the, the core values of the internet. And we can extract lessons from the history of internet governance and apply them to the governance of artificial intelligence in specific and differentiated fields. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for, for introducing uh, us. Uh, to the work of the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values, and I do appreciate how we, you explained what AI can do uh, is beneficial, but also maybe it's not so beneficial. Uh, let me now go to Avri Doria, who is here for the Dynamic Coalition on Internet of Things, and uh, also uh, DCIoT is one of the most grown-up Dynamic Coalitions, I think. Uh, so you have a long-standing experience in Internet of Things. But what about the people that shall benefit from Internet of Things? Reflecting the last five days, I assume that uh, the most often term I've heard is human-centered. And so my question would be, what does it mean to you and to the Dynamic Coalition of Internet of Things? And what steps does the Dynamic Coalition take to ensure a human-centered open and inclusive internet, and how does this play out to fast-tracking the SDGs? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, and we have been working on the Internet of Things Dynamic Coalition for quite a while. When the Dynamic Coalition first started, it was before things were as ubiquitous as everywhere as they are now. The concern was the things are coming, and we didn't know whether they would be on the internet, of the internet, somehow different from the internet. Discussions we hear in other subjects these days. And eventually we found out that what was really important was how they, the things, were interacting with us, how we worked with them, how we treated them, how we used and took care of them so that people were benefited from them. And, and one of the things that, that, that basically happened when we started working with the Internet of Things is we decided that a set of values were, were necessary for best practices for the, the, the items that were part of the Internet of Things. Sort of an effort that started at the similar time as the, the Dynamic Coalition on Core Values in the Internet. And so started looking at what were the best practices that one would need to have if an internet of things or things existing on our internet were to interact with human populations, with cities, with people in general, were to be human-centered? How would we do that? How could we assure that they were properly maintained so that they didn't become dangerous, so that they remained beneficial? How could we control the access so that the things were not being accessed in a bad way, but only in a good way? How could we control that? How could we basically make sure that the number and the, and the profusion of things that were collecting data collected that data and that data was treated and stored properly? So, so the Dynamic Coalition, in, in the process from 2008, when we first started talking about it, almost as just objects to 2018 when, when, the, um, when the IoT good practices came out was basically looking at 
how they affected us as people, how they could be used in, in a human-centric way. Now, as we started looking at those good values, we found that they were often far more true as um, aspirations, as intentions, as goals than they were in practice. And then we started looking with the SDGs as to how Internet of Things could actually be used to, to, to assist, to solve the goals of that. And, and then you start going through the list of them, you know, uh, zero hunger, that's the things that obviously are everywhere in agriculture and such, or for health, the number of objects and things that are used in health, that are implanted in bodies and such to help maintain health. Clear water and sanitation, affordable and clear en clean energy, decent, uh, in, in decent environment, clean air, etc. That basically each of the problems that you look at in the sustainable development goals is one that can be helped or hindered by the objects that we place in the world that basically collect data that affect the world because the things don't just collect data, they initiate actions. And so how do we make sure that, 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 the, that they're well controlled and only controlled in, in a proper and, and safe way? So basically these values have been established and now we start looking at the impact analysis of Internet of Things, of how do we, how do we make sure that there's proper access control? How do we make sure that a, 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 an object that's been planted in our environment that no longer has a purpose or has purpose has become deleterious can be dealt with and such? So those are the problems that the Dynamic Coalition takes on, talks about, tries to publish um, analyses on, and, and, and con to, to continue doing its work. Thank you, Ari, for this. So, Internet of Things with a human face, so to speak. Uh, it gives me pleasure now, as a digital immigrant, to look towards a digital native. We have Theo from the uh, Youth Coalition on Internet Values with us. And I would like to ask her, how do you see the role of young people and the internet in fast-tracking the SDGs? And also, what hope and expectations does the young generation have on internet governance for the future? And what impact it can have on today's young people? Please feel. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me today. And it is... Uh, I feel very uh, proud of being here because that uh, as a young people, we, I could sit together with the senior people at the high level panel. That, that is very good for include the young people voices in the different session like that uh, to hear the young people what they are challenging over in the internet as well as uh, how young people are struggling over to get engaged in this community, as well as uh, to advocate about the SDG uh, for moving uh, forward to the better future of the internet. Of course, SDG goals are also uh, linking with our physical world, as well as in this digital era, it is also becoming, since the pandemic, uh, we have been engaging and we have been using the internet uh, in our daily life. And even uh, <clears throat> we have been noted that <clears throat> many young people are doing many jobs online and for not only for themselves, but also for the community work. Uh, for example, like our YCIG member uh, are very actively engaging at the INSAR Youth Standing Group for empowering young people to get involved in the internet governance community, as well as we have been engaged with the Net Mission Door Asia, which is also the um, uh, youth program from the Asia Pacific region for uh, empowering the young people for building their capacity about the internet governance and also support the young people uh, to uh, 
get involved and continue their participation at the internet governance community. So I think this is um, supporting the young people and uh, representing our voices in the community is very uh, matter to uh, uh, to reach out to more people because uh, 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 in my perspective, it's like uh, but, uh, young people are born with uh, some people, uh, not some people, uh, young people are born with the technology, but they are now facing a lot of the issue in their era for addressing and getting involved in the internet, uh, uh, in, in, in their respective local community, of course, regional and the global community. We are now uh, challenges with the internet issue, why internet is innovating on one hand. This is the thing that we, uh, the young people are the uh, very important right now to bridge the next generation and also uh, um, engaging in addressing the issue of the internet um, moving forward for the, um, for Ismaili uh, advocating about the uh, in, uh, eco, uh, internet and the carbon footprint. This is also very important that, uh, you know, uh, some, sometimes uh, we didn't know that uh, especially from the uh, young people from the uh, developing countries are not very noticed about the how internet is impacted and even they don't understand that how the internet is work and how the internet is impacting our daily life and how the algorithms are working, uh, uh, social media algorithms are working uh, or using our data or something like that. Um, so um, we have been, uh, as a YCIG, we have been uh, encouraged the young people facilitating the workshop in 2020 to engage at the Internet Governance Forum 2022. And also uh, this year we have been uh, um, taking the part of the mentorship role at the ISR U Ambassador Program where the young people as uh, to um, as a mentor to uh, support them and to march in and to bridge them with the internet governor community uh, for the, building their better understandings and to keep them to continue participate in this community. But so far we are facing a lot of challenges like uh, resource, especially related to the resources. Um, such as like financial resources, time resources, because as a young people, we have to, we need to upgrade our skill because we are still needing to sit here like that uh, for talking about the issue and but through our better understanding first and then also uh, we have to, we also have to uh, have, uh, uh, we also have the concerns about finding, uh, finding stability for learnings or for getting access to uh, um, uh, uh, internet, for example, like the internet is in some region, like the internet is not affordable at all. It is getting more and more expensive. What is, uh, why it is getting more and more expensive? It is very clear that the <clears throat> because of the political impact that are suffering in the country like Myanmar and uh, Afghanistan are also uh, very difficult to get access to the internet. The internet is uh, getting more and more expensive and uh, not every, every young people are not very easy to get access to the internet. Uh, getting access to the internet is also uh, a part of our life to assess the resources about the education, uh, also uh, assess the uh, not, uh, ass assessing the information uh, about the uh, global issue or something like that, and also to take impact on the capacity building program, like the fellowship program, and ambassador program, and also uh, to. Um, um, and also to um, engage with the um, uh, global and local and regional community because we are uh, from the different times of working together for the common goal. So uh, internet, and uh, when they are not no longer affordable to pay for the internet, they have been left behind. 
that is a key point that uh, that is uh, one of the examples that I would like to highlight. Another thing is that young people are very actively, uh, very active in advocating and uh, working on the activism work, uh, for example, like freedom of speech and uh, uh, digital rights relate, uh, related. Uh, matter, but w on one hand, that digital space is not no longer space at all. So how they cur, uh, how 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 will impact their advocacy? They only have to consider that how there there might be the impact and there might be a risk to them uh, uh, when they when they do uh, something that the government don't like. You know, like I know uh, there are. Then uh, the, the war in the war, there are lots of the uh, uh, governments are supporting to the young people, but there are also many governments are uh, oppressing over the young people voice and uh, also uh, and 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 uh, oppressing uh, oppressing over the young people, not uh, uh, not uh, uh, stop and stopping them to. Uh, 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 criminalized uh, cases like that uh, when they speak out on the online or uh, when they speak about their uh, environmental issue online. That is uh, that is uh, inevitable that we are facing, and also uh, young people are very uh, young people needs more support from the um, different kinds of the organization to. Uh, also uh, to addressing the issue together for moving forward to the sustainable development goal as well as for uh, going into the common goal like one world, one internet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fio, for making the voice of young people heard in this session and for all the aspects that you've addressed. You have been speaking about the ecological ecological crisis as well as of uh, very important other things. But this gives me the opportunity to refer on the one hand to the general comment number 25 that the United Nations Committee for the Children of the Rights have adopted. And this uh, general comment addresses several of the issues, especially, especially <clears throat> not to criminalize uh, the activities that young people perform on the internet. And it's not uh, a coincidence that after number 25, uh, general command number 26 on env environmental issues and their impact on children's rights has been adopted right, I think only four weeks ago. So, and with that said, I would like to call uh, the dynamic coalition on environment that is, has are supposed to be in the room to give their short 90-minute intervention from the microphone right there. Oh, 90 seconds. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so 90 seconds, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, my name is Saptoshi, and I represent uh, DC Environment. Uh, it has been such an insightful discussion, but I want to add a point to this uh, ongoing discussion. I believe with human rights, we also need to speak about human duties. They have to work together. At DC Environment, we have been working on action-oriented policy papers, which puts focus on human duties. In this year's DC report, we talk about how unchecked urbanization is causing biodiversity loss, which in turn is impacting our mental health negatively. It is time to incorporate action-oriented duties in our discussions. We need to leverage technology, especially internet, to propagate and educate uh, school students so that the next generation is prepared to do whatever is needed to ensure the world is a uh, livable space in the near future. Lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank IGF to facilitate such important discussions at this forum. Thank you. Thank you, and now, I and given to understand that there's also the dynamic coalition of jobs that would like to make an intervention. When I release the reports, I'll make the intervention on digital health and jobs. Okay, then is the dynamic coalition on digital health is on my list. Then it's children, dynamic coalition on children. children's rights, to be precise, please. 
Thank you very much for giving me the floor, um, and thank you much, very much for, you for speaking on behalf of young people. I have to say it's very exciting to see so many young people engaged in the processes here. Um, I represent the Dynamic Coalition on Children's Rights in the Digital Environment, and has, as my colleague Yuta has referred to, um, we're, we're a dynamic coalition built upon um, the principles and, 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 the, and the content of the, of the general comment number 25 on, on children's rights in relation to the digital environment. Um, and I think it's also really exciting, and I would like to thank all my other DC uh, colleagues, speakers from other DCs to, um, to, to, to see the full potential of how we can work together to ensure from our perspective that children's rights are really understood and acknowledged within all of the work that you're doing and how we can understand and, and contribute to your work. Um, and for us, it's very exciting to be part of um, the IGF and have the opportunity to, to bring the voices of children with, with young people and children themselves to, to these crucial debates about the future of the internet. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Amy. So now we are calling Rajendra for the Dynamic Coalition on Jobs and on Digital Health. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, good evening to those who are joining online. As the organizer for the plenary of the DC session, I thank the IGF for the opportunity, support, and the trust they have given us. Today, we release uh, four reports, uh, probably substantive work of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet and Jobs. This is probably the uh, world's biggest project on job creation. Uh, that we do uh, using technology. It's called Project Create. And thanks, Windsor, for the mentorship, uh, for the report that we see, because I believe totally aligned to the theme of this session, human rights in digital age. There will be no human rights if there are no source of livelihoods. You can't fight for them, basically. So I think this project is very important. And we have created job map for nine sectors. This is in it, and we'll work through the year. And this is what we promised in Ethiopia on the 30th October last year. Uh, the second report we release is Urbanization, Biodiversity, and Mental Health. This is important because what we call as the mindless growth that we show up as development, which it is not. And you will see in this report that urbanization is leading to, leading to loss of biodiversity, which is going to lead to mental health issues. If we do not address this, the mental health pandemic will shadow all the pandemics. I think this is an important issue given the fact that Digital footprint has a carbon footprint. We have to address this, and this also is a report for that. Uh, we are releasing this report on the state of digital health 2022, which uh, covers 58 countries. We have done it under IGF, Dynamic Coalition on Digital Health, which I think addresses the three 80s, what I call it. The 80% of the people in the world have no access to health. 80% of the people in the world cannot afford health. And 80% of the people have acute illnesses which means that out of those three ATAs, we need the four A, which is artificial intelligence, to address these three ATs. And of course, the last report, Internet and Jobs, covers uh, 75 countries, six continents. And our focus has been, as Dynamic Coalition on Internet and Jobs, that Internet plays an important role in job creation. This is our mandate, this is our remit, and this is our work. And uh, this also shows the phenomenal groundwork that Dynamic Coalitions do in terms of thought leadership, in terms of giving direction to key things of IGF and moving the things on ground. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Rajendra, for giving us the presence. <laughs> and I do think only that I was able to flicker through it that it's very important we spread that around the room to give it to more people and to give more people access. I'm pretty sure we have digital copies on the internet and probably we can we can give also the URL and the links. Um, I'm not sure whether we have uh, further dynamic coalitions in the room who want to take the floor for their 90 seconds. 
Uh, if you are so, please make you're ready to go to the microphone. And otherwise, we would like to take also questions from the floor from the participants in this session. Please come forward, put your questions to the dynamic collisions. And even if it be, how can I join any of the dynamic collisions that have been presented here so far? It has been now objective to make the session as interactive as possible, so we really rely on you to ask questions and make comments. We can also turn to the online participants. Are there any comments online, or is there any online participants who would like to intervene? Hi, so there are two questions online. One is from Mr. James from Cameroon. He says, what strategies can be employed to enhance the practical relevance of established international norms for professionals and which resources can be harnessed in their daily responsibilities? Do we have one of the panelists who want to take this question? Well, the question is about standards. And I know we have a dynamic collision on standards. Is anyone in the room who want to take the question? Yes. Um, I can certainly add that within the dynamic coalition on, on IoT, having standards that can then be used by many to, to come up with, with you know, a certain level of transparency, a certain level of interoperability, a certain level of expected behaviors that, that are acceptable to consumers are critical. And, and, and so within the, the, the values that are promoted in good, in, in good practice are indeed the development and adherence to standards. So certainly it's, it's of vital importance. Thank you, Avery. But Mohammed, you also want to add something in the regard of standards? Uh, yes, quickly. As a dynamic coalition on accessibility and disability, we always encourage to follow the web content accessibility guidelines. That would be the version 2.1 right now. Uh, these are the standards to develop accessible websites, online platforms, mobile apps, etc. Uh, in an accessible way for the persons with disabilities to use. And Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and, and Disability always encourages the developers to follow these standards. Thank you, Mohammed. So we have Windsurf. It's an honor for us to have you here in our session and to ask us a, a question. So this is a question to uh, Shabir, uh, although uh, certainly uh, any of you who wish to respond are free to do so. It has to do with uh, increasing our ability and our capacity to produce accessible interfaces to all of the applications on the internet. My impression is that uh, creating standards doesn't necessarily create capacity to use those standards effectively. Some of you are familiar with the Khan Academy, uh, which has grown over time to en encompass a great many more subjects than uh, just mathematics. Uh, but the example of that academy made me think of asking people with disabilities to help the rest of us, especially those of us who are responsible for developing software uh, that's used online, to uh, intuitively understand how to apply the standards to make things accessible. What I've found as I learn more about this problem is that examples of things that work and things that don't work and explanations about why they work or don't work may be the most effective way of helping people, uh, programmers, gain an intuition for how to make use of, of technology for accessibility. Just to, uh, Shabir, I'm sure you would resonate with this. If you don't know how a screen reader works, then how are you gonna make a web page that works well with a screen reader? So there, we really need to build more capacity, and I would invite those of you interested in this to uh, think about how we can increase our capacity to do a better job. 
Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Wint, for making this comment. Actually, uh, this was exactly what I was thinking about, that we need to build capacities. And just to step out of a little bit uh, broader domain that we are discussing here in the dynamic coalitions, uh, to build capacities, actually, uh, what I said in the beginning was that to have you have to have actual people, uh, those who are being impacted by these technologies, interacting with these kind of initiatives. Uh, same is the case with the development side. You now there are technologies that make enable persons with disabilities to study these degrees, software development, software engineering, computer sciences, and, and all those technologies. So on, the, on one level, we have to encourage persons with disabilities to come into these fields, to join, to study these uh, educational degrees and to work in these domains so that the other people, those who would be your co-worker or colleagues, juniors, seniors, they would know of that you are there and you have the requirements. On the other hand, the, the certain measures could be taken to uh, inform the development side, different degrees. Those could include requirements and training programs for training the persons without disabilities about the requirements and impacts of uh, having these technologies accessible and not having these, these technologies accessible. Uh, in certain cases, there are just physical requirements where people are unable to uh, reach to the certain content which may be available on the website if that is not available with the screen reader. But in certain cases, it could be a legal liability. For instance, the, the Section 508 in the United States and so on and so forth, there are other standards which which are legally bound to be followed by the governments to, to make the certain uh, platforms to a certain level accessible. But as I said, this is, uh, this is a very interesting debate that we need to uh, continue. But certainly, Vint, thank you very much for, for this uh, very crucial point that you indicated that the people actually developing these technologies need to know about the standards. Uh, for um, instance, uh, some Muhammad, 10 years back. Time out. We need a time out to give more people to take the floor. They are already queuing. Thank you so much. But I don't want to interrupt you, but just to give Lisa also the chance to react to your in input, and then we have more questions. A short intervention, Lisa. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about this from the educator perspective, because we're working very deeply with education systems now and uh, faculty within them who are creating open educational resources to develop these kinds of standards that are 508 compliant. So for example, and this, doesn't t this doesn't solve the problem at the software development level, but if you have uh, educators who are creating uh, resources for the first time. There are mechanisms, mechanisms that you can put into the authoring platforms, I mean, at the very basic level, so that there's, they can't put a picture without adding alt text. I mean, it, it starts simple in that way and, of course, gets to, you know, much more complicated things. What I want to say in our education systems is our accessibility offices have really been so much about how you make accommodations and how you get, uh, you know, a particular book to a student in a chemistry class who is, um, you know, sight impaired or something like this, as opposed to thinking about what does it look like if these uh, resources are born um, accessible and, you know, what does that need to look like at the creation level, at the course creation level or at the resource creation level. So, uh, and this also I just want to um, add in the uh, issue of uni universal design for learning. This is something that I think we're really understanding um, in the U.S. and globally that we need to think about disability on a whole spectrum uh, that is not necessarily device specific anymore. And that's what a lot of these accessibility offices were experts in. What's the device that gets you as opposed to what's the resource itself? Uh, it's Vin again. I, thank you for letting me intervene one more time. I wanted to reinforce something that, uh, that Shabir said. 
we have uh, two deaf Googlers uh, who were responsible for developing one application called Live Transcribe, which basically takes sound in and transcribes it on your mobile so that you can see what the other person is saying. It works in 120 languages, and it was developed by uh, a deaf Russian engineer at Google. The other thing is captioning for YouTube was developed by another deaf engineer. So I want to reinforce the point that people with these problems also can have the skill to help us develop applications that, uh, that uh, accommodate. Uh, and I want to reinforce the point about broad accommodation as opposed to device-specific things. You're quite right about that, too. Thank you for the lively debate. And I'm, I'm uh, quite happy that more than 20 years after the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines have been adopted, we can give a bit of stamina to, to that uh, input. Uh, uh, now we have uh, Alejandro raising his fro uh, hand from, from Zoom, and then we go to Mark Howell from the Standards Safety and Security Dynamic Coalition. Alejandro, you have the floor. Thank you. Quick reply to the question about standards, uh, complementing what has already been said. Uh, as uh, things move into the Internet of Things, for example, the standards issue becomes very complex. Uh, you have to distinguish between the consumer Internet of Things, which m runs mostly over the open Internet. It's just more IP traffic, more TCP IP traffic or UDP traffic. And the industrial Internet of Things, which may choose in some segments of communication to use the open Internet. Let's say if you are operating an autonomous vehicle or a connected vehicle, uh, and what is available is Wi-Fi, uh, then that will be uh, what you use or you know, your standard internet connection. But otherwise, you have LoRaWAN, you have lots of other standards uh, taking place, and it's a very complex architecture. Uh, that's number one. The expectation for artificial intelligence would be that some standards for interoperability, for example, between LLMs should arise, and we will be facing this same complexity. And on the other hand, what's happening with some applications of artificial intelligence, including uh, generative LLMs, is that they are substituting for the lack of standards because they are just translating imperfectly with biases, you know, with lots of trouble, but they are just jumping over the hurdles uh, by doing things like Vincent or what we have seen, for example, the incredible uh, progress in uh, automatic translation. Um, and again, these things, it's very important to keep them in mind within core internet values, the IGF, our context, this multi-stakeholder governance, making sure all stakeholders are at the table. Your system will never be better than your uh, case uh, studies before you start developing. So that's the kind of, uh, of, of thing where we can really make sure we involve all relevant stakeholders. Final point, you may have a technical standard, uh, like for example, for accessibility, for the blind or for the weak, uh, so, so for the for the weak of sight, uh, and you can still have the designers uh, paint, uh, you know, pale jade over turquoise, uh, you know, letters over background, and uh, that will pass a Bobby test, and you will still have something that people cannot read. Uh, so it takes a lot of commitment, and we should ask, for example, key actors like government uh, websites to set the standard. Uh, of behavior, not only the technical written standard, but the standard of behavior about accessibility. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Can we now turn to Mark Carvel behind this microphone? Yeah, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, the name is Mark Carvel. I'm a policy advisor for IS3C, which is a dynamic coalition. Uh, we've been going for the last uh, three years. Uh, IS3C stands for Internet Standards, Security and Safety. And the, the focus of our coalition is on the failure to deploy existing standards in the whole Internet uh, ecosystem. We have uh, a range of working groups. The, the first working group we set up is looking at security by design, and that has just uh, uh, published a report which has surveyed policies worldwide relating to uh, Internet of Things and, and, and policy provisions with regard and practices with regard to, to standards. 
and that will be the basis for further work to examine the whole issue of how to make Internet of Things much more uh, secure and, and, uh, and safe. We have a working group which is looking at the gaps in educational, curricular and vocational training relating to cybersecurity standards. And that uh, is now developing a proposal for creating a cybersecurity hub which will bring together industry and educationists to look at this, to start examining whether there is potential for creating a, a kind of repository on cybersecurity standards that educationists can use which will meet the requirements of industry. We have another working group which is looking at what we believe is a, an important driver for the take-up of standards, which is public and private sector procurement and supply chain management. The work that that working group has done so far has, has I confirmed that a lot of procurement <laughs> contracts do not specify cybersecurity standards. When, when government offices, for example, go out to purchase devices and network applications, there isn't any specific uh, uh, stipulation as to what their buying should include with, uh, in respect of, of standards relating to security. We're launching a new working group which will look at routing uh, and RPKI and uh, DNSSEC in particular, why there's not been widespread take up of those important standards. So, and, and also we're drawing up uh, what we hope will be a valuable toolkit which will set out the key cybersecurity standards that will be a reference point for internet uh, stakeholders, users, purchasers and so on in the future. So we've got a lot of work uh, on the go and, and we'll be launching new aspects of work which will bring cybersecurity standards much more to the center of awareness what can contribute to greater security and safety online. And of course, this intersects with the whole uh, sustainable development goals agenda with regard to resilient, uh, robust, secure infrastructure that will serve the interests of the health uh, uh, sector, financial sector, and so on. So there are a whole range of SDGs which we think our work will contribute to. So I hope that uh, I've got, if I've gone over 90 seconds, <laughs> do apologize, but we're doing so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Yuta, can I make one comment to that? Uh, yes, of Just course. Just 30 seconds. I implore you, if you're going to be creating cybersecurity curriculum, there are groups already that are, are looking at this. Please do it as open educational resources, because so many times we're seeing the corporations go in and create their training programs around cybersecurity, but then that becomes private and commercial. We need this to be openly licensed. So there's a community of people already working on cybersecurity. I'm sure they would welcome uh, the kind of expertise that you're talking about. Well noted, thank you very much. I'm quite glad that, to see that the networking is already going on between uh, dynamic collisions. And I wanted to recommend also that Mohammed has mentioned Section 508 in the United States, and that is except, exactly an example how public procurement uh, had, or the standard had an impact on public procurement. So probably, Mark, you should go in contact with Mohammed to learn more about Section 508 and then see whether that approach could also be adapted to security standards in procurement. Um, we have another question from the floor. Thank you. I'm Moro from the National Library of Indonesia. I just want to add that the library, from the library perspective, Right now, libraries are very focused on building awareness amongst uh, libraries that the public access they offer give them a role or even a responsibility to help deliver the SDGs, building on their pre-existing values base. We are trying to get a stronger, more purposive, and more structured approach to having positive impact in terms of development and delivery of the rights. Though the enrichment of the particular one, freedom of access to information. So for us, for libraries, it will be about how 
a localized delivery of the right of access to information through libraries is helping to deliver. As part of this, we are building awareness, strategic planning, and a sense of agency and duty. It is important to have rights and the SDGs as the structure goal and to keep our eyes on this. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. The libraries have always been very active participants and we have a dynamic coalition, libraries, and the, our rapporteur actually represents the International Federation of Library Associations and he will may say a few words at the end of our session. But we have a, somebody else behind the microphone here. Please, you have the floor and introduce yourself. I am a Japanese nutrition who lost some of her speed due to traffic accident. I worked in a remote medical field and studied at Osaka Kyoiku University's Graduate School of Education, majoring in health science. My name is Akemi Yokoyama. I am an Asian Pacific leader for people with disability and volunteer leader for the Osaka Cancer Expo in Japan. After a traffic accident, I studied actively at the Japan Rehabilitation Association. Even here in Japan, there are many people who do not have an internet People with disability in Japan have both in intellectual and mental disability, which also overlap with physical disability. One third of Japanese people are elderly, dementia. We ask for your help in providing diverse, diverse accessibility, providing the digital divide and water and food for disability and elderly people around the world. If particular, in particular, he, he thanks us for God, Afghanistan, Syria, and Libya, and also um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for these comments. It's very much appreciated. We have so, so, somebody. Online, yes, online, someone is there who would like to intervene. Yes. Benin, you can go. So we have one more comment from Zoom. Mavis, yes. would you like to go yes. ahead? Uh, Benin wanted to intervene. Benin, can you please speak? You have raised your hand. Okay, so we have one more question from Miss Monica Emmert. How well have the results of the DC's work been received in industry and legislative work? How can the DCs strengthen the impact and perhaps avoid duplication of work like Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet? So I, I'm going to start and then you will continue because you have the long-standing experience with dynamic collisions. Uh, at this point, I would say that it's a bit difficult to give an answer across all the dynamic collisions. Uh, the work of some of the dynamic collisions very much related uh, to research and it's well appreciated like we have seen in the reports that Rajanda has already handed out. Um, while other dynamic collisions are more in the field of practice, like for example the dynamic collision on public access in libraries, which they are really practicing giving people access uh, who otherwise wouldn't have access to the internet. But maybe Marcus, you want to add something? Well, I think what we always say, it's very difficult to have a common denominator for all dynamic collisions as they're so diverse. 
they're diverse in scope. Some, as you have heard, work more on principles, whereas others are more very much practical, such as the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility has both practical and also policy aspects. So it, it's very difficult to give a common assessment, but especially the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility for People with Disabilities has had a very direct impact. And we heard from Mohammed also how they continue to have impact. But I open the floor to the other panelists, maybe who have concrete examples or would like to give your assessment. Anybody willing to venture forward? But again, uh, yes, Lisa, I, I can please. Try, I'll try this. I know that, I mean, one thing I think I've really learned being here this week, uh, how, how much the work that we do in the education system around access to knowledge is somewhat, is, is somewhat disconnected from the larger conversations about governance and privacy and you know, the, the issues uh, f that other people are dealing with in the dynamic coalitions, yet they seem to be very essentially uh, related. And in fact, if the people that we work with on the ground understood that they really are part of a digital equity agenda, and it isn't just about an, an issue of education and access to education, if they saw the, the larger picture, I think it could be very useful. So it would be interesting to try to find how we can make some of those connections, even if it's around messaging and communi communications, it seems that there's some uh, real potential to have deeper, um, deeper impact around the SDGs if we're able to do that together. We have Alejandro who would like to intervene. Thank you. Uh, I would like to go further in, in this question. As uh, Marcos correctly said, the impact is very heterogeneous, and we have to work out ways to get closer, especially to industry, uh, by changing the, the messaging uh, between the IGF and certain sectors of the industry. Uh, some uh, sectors of the industry are close to the IGF. They have been since the start uh, of the IGF, good sponsors. They send uh, high-level, technically informed representatives. They absorb what comes out of the IGF. We need to make this happen more. Uh, and uh, we certainly have a much better example here of this type of collaboration and uh, the way it, uh, it carries to, to industry than what we can expect if, this, uh, if the IGF is uh, uh, minimized in its role uh, in, as attention goes to things like the global digital compact and the potential interest of creating a higher level, all-encompassing governance uh, instance for everything digital. That will certainly make sure that industry goes completely into a defensive uh, uh, attitude and, uh, and uh, no uh, multi-stakeholder message will get through to industry. And uh, further, uh, one can foresee that, for example, as the GDC has already talked about a tripartite uh, arrangement between government, industry, and civil society without including the technical community, without including the technical knowledge necessary for governing or evolving the system, uh, we can be sure that eventually the powers of industry and government will come together and squeeze out uh, civil society. So it's a paradoxal and complex situation. What we have to do is document more and communicate more the IGF work to industry and make sure that they feel as an equal partner instead of attending preventively. A lot of industries do send representatives only to listen uh, and prepare against what they will see as an attack of regulation of legislation two years down the road in their countries. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. That gives me a nice segue into a final question as we give each panelist the opportunity for some final comments. And I would like to ask them, how do you see the role of Dynamic Coalition in the new environment? And one of the big questions was the future of the IGF and the relationship to the uh, GDC. And do you see 
uh, role of the dynamic relation in implementing and follow up of whatever will come out of the global digital compact. Shall we start at the other end with the youth dynamic coalition? But be, can you be very, very concise because we're mm -hmm. shortly going to run out of time. One, uh, one minute. Uh, thank you. I will be very concise. <laughs> I think it's really important because uh, 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 internet governance, communities, uh, multi-stakeholder models, and even the voices are coming from the bottom, uh, bottom f f to the up. So it is very important to include the uh, young people voices to the GDC uh, as well as, um, and also for shaping the futures of the internet. They are very critical as uh, they are playing the key role in the shaping the internet for uh, it being the better internet as well as uh, for, uh, for the safe digital space. Thank you. Mohamed. Yes, thank you. Uh, just quickly, a uh, couple of points. One, uh, there is a common misconception that uh, if the work is done for accessibility, it would be beneficial for persons with disabilities. It's uh, a misconception. Any website or forum made accessible for persons with disabilities can be used and have been used by other person and it's been reported that it was, it was more beneficial than it would be otherwise. Uh, secondly, the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability is ready to uh, cooperate with any of the IGF forums, be it MSG, uh, MAG, the Leadership Panel, or the Secretariat, uh, for cooperation in making the digital environment and Internet Governance Forum accessible for people with disabilities, and the voice of people with disabilities should be uh, heard there. Uh, lastly, the accessibility work is not just for people with disabilities. We all are aging, and we may at some point in our lives require these accessibility accommodations. So it's better to start when we are in power and in a position to make things happen than to lament afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? Uh, from, I think I can say this on behalf of the OER Dynamic Coalition, which is, you know, we're working with member states and governments to institute these policies around education, uh, to not, not restrict access to education by, in fact, providing open educational resources. So if there are, as, as a newbie, uh, as, a, as a newer Dynamic Coalition, if there's ways that we can work with other Dynamic Coalitions, you know, to the old adage of we can go, f uh, you know, further together. Uh, I think it would be really helpful to look at how the policies uh, around the internet are in sync or not in sync with those around governments and education and access to education. And then one just one quick thing too. Uh, you know, you asked a question of our speaker on on youth who so eloquently talked about uh, the youth voice, and you asked her the question about how to fast track. Uh, the efforts, and I'm thinking that question is for all of us. Uh, we, you know, youth came as maybe digital natives to this, but they, you know, are inheriting what we have here. And so, any way that we can all think of fast tracking and not just wait for a year from now to sort of talk about our impact, I think that's of uh, the, the most crucial importance. Thank you, and Avery. Perhaps I'm being simplistic. But I look at GDC, an essentially top-down set of uh, principles. I look at dynamic coalitions, an essentially bottom-up set of principles. So I think it would be problematic. I think we would continue to strive, as we've done with the IGF, to get, to get acceptance. But I really do believe it would be problematic. Thank you. I wonder whether our two rapporteurs would like to give a very, very short tweet-like uh, summing up and introduce yourself with your name, please. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I'm Priya Shukla, coordinator of DC Internet and Jobs and also the rapporteur for the DC main session. I'd like to say that it was a very insightful session, however, um, and with uh, many takeaways and call to action, 
but it will not be able to reiterate the whole discussion in just a few points. However, I'll give two key takeaways here. The internet we want should be accessible, equitable, which helps in capacity building. However, it also has to be sustainable. And second, that internet has to be human-centered. And the call to action points that I feel should be that global organization for internet governance should be established. And second, there should be a focus on both human rights and human duties. We have never talked about human duties before. So I hope all the DCs will come together and not just work in silos to bring these key takeaways and uh, call to action points into actual practice. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephen? Hi, so I'm <coughs> sorry, Stephen Weiber from the... <coughs> so Stephen Weiber, I'm primarily here as a reporter, but also with the Dynamic Coalition sorry. on public access and libraries. I, I think the two overall points I came away with were firstly that there's a sense that, I don't know, Dynamic coalitions are here to address the delivery gap between the promise of the internet and actually delivering on human rights and on the SDGs. Um, and actually providing the sort of wealth and richness of understanding of what that gap is, what are we missing out on, I don't know, what is the contour of the space that we need to fill with action in order to make sure that the internet actually re re delivers on its potential for everyone. Um, and then the second, which has came out towards the end, the idea that collectively the DCs make it possible for internet governance to be a form of reflective practice, um, by which I mean that um, it's a space where we need to be looking critically at what's going on and we need to be understanding what is actually going on and why are there links, where are there links between the way the technology that the internet is developing and, um, and, and the outcomes people are experiencing. Why is what we hope would happen not happening? What is missing and so on? And they provide this lasting space to actually do that. And I, I don't know, that's crunched down into the term reflective practice. Um, in terms of calls, I think the first one actually is, is Avery's one there, that if, if the GDC is supposed to be providing a sort of chapeau for all internet governance discussions and, and, and how do we answer the question of what should be done, then actually the GDC needs to bake in that bottom-up process. It needs to leave that space for that to happen. And then the second one, I think simply um, celebrating this model of having a space where all stakeholders can be there because you can't reflect if you can't see and you can't see if you don't have everyone actually present and taking part. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you. And I ask now my co-moderator, Jutta, to give her final thoughts on yes. this session. Please. Thank you. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Jutta, I would sorry, no. like to... Sorry, we don't have time. So my, my takeaway from the session is that the internet we want can only be achieved by dialogue and collaboration. And I've heard people wanting more participation in the deliberations of the Global Digital Compact. And I do think that the dynamic collisions and this session shows that uh, the bottom-up approach of the dynamic collisions could provide for that uh, dialogue for that collaboration and common deliberations. So we have to bring something forward. We have to combine the top down with the bottom up. And with that, I thank you all for your participation. And I thank you for being with us. And uh, please, I ask you, invite you to join me in thanking our panelists with a round of applause. Thank you. And that closes our session. Thank you.